Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for the third virtual program of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. We're so happy to have you here today for Explore the Arboretum. We're going to get a virtual tour of the Jacksonville Arboretum and Gardens. I am Denise Reagan. I'm the Executive Director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And with me here today is our Operations Manager, Damian Lamar Robinson. Hi, Damian. Hello, everybody. Hi, Denise. Um, and we're actually in two different places because, uh, you know, when you're virtual, you can do that. <laughs> so um, we would like to thank very much the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund for making it possible for us to start these virtual programs. Uh, their support uh, helped us get our uh, technical uh, stuff together so that we could bring these to you. So thank you to the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. So we always like to start off with a poll and kind of take the temperature of everybody out there. And in this case, we're going to share a poll that asks, when's the last time you visited the Jacksonville Arboretum and Gardens? So go ahead and vote. Give us an idea of your familiarity. And I bet even if you've been there many times, you will find some things out that you did not know about the Jacksonville Arboretum and Gardens. We have about 78% voted at this point. Getting up to 80s. See if we can get a complete 100% voting. Give it five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. Damien, tell us how people voted. Well, we have a, a wider range of, of responses, but it looks like a lot of people have not been to the Arboretum and are excited to go. And a couple of people, about six of you guys, have been more than a year. It's been more than a year, so you haven't been in a while. Last year, last month, and last week. So um, we have a pretty good group. All right. So that just gives us a little idea of your familiarity, but uh, we've got a lot of new people that need to go to the Arboretum and hopefully you will be inspired to do just that after this program. So I'm gonna close that out. You may need to close it on your screen and we're going to introduce our speakers for the day. First off, we have Dana Duty, who's the executive director of the Jacksonville Arboretum and Gardens. Duty brings more than 13 years of nonprofit experience to the position and most recently served as director of development with the North Florida Land Trust, where she raised more than $3 million. She's also a Florida master naturalist. Previously, Dana worked as an account manager for the Jacksonville Regional Chamber of Commerce, where she created the Health Council for the Chamber, which remains one of the, most, the Chamber's most successful councils. She also worked with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, where she oversaw three events, and added a new event, CF Climb, which was well received for the town of Gainesville. She was named a Jacksonville Business Journal Woman of Influence in 2018. Dana grew up on the west side of Jacksonville and attended Florida State College at Jacksonville. She is also a graduate of the President's Program of Sandler Sales Institute. We're very happy to have Dana here, but we also have some of the Jacksonville Arboretum's volunteers. We have Doug Gagne, who is a graduate of the North Dakota School of Forestry at Botano. He has volunteered at many nature centers, including years of experience as a nature tour guide at the Jacksonville Arboretum and Gardens. He has completed all seven courses of the University of Florida's Master, eh, master Naturalist Program and is certified as a Master Naturalist and Land Steward. He attended an Earth Education Seminar in New York's Adirondack Mountains. A veteran of the U.S. Air Force. Dana, you may want to go ahead and mute yourself while we're doing this. Okay. Thank you. A veteran of the U.S. Air Force during Vietnam, during the Vietnam veteran era, uh, during the Vietnam era, Doug recently retired as a church pastor and hospital chaplain in Fernandina Beach. He and his wife Judy are the parents of four and grandparents of ten children and they live in Nocatee. So happy to have Doug here. We also have, Damon, you may need to mute somebody since we have uh, a dog going in the background. <laughs> All right. 
We also have Catherine Grage, a rising junior at the University of Richmond, majoring in mathematics and environmental studies with plans to go to graduate school for entomology. Catherine is originally from Syracuse, New York, and is volunteering at the Arboretum for the summer until she returns to school. In her free time, Catherine enjoys wheel throwing and creating ceramic sculptures that are etched with different insects and spiders. We also have one more volunteer who's gonna be running the camera for a lot of our speakers today. Caitlin Murray is volunteering with the Arboretum this summer. She is a student at the Paxson School for Advanced Studies. And like I say, she'll be our, one of our camera people and we're so happy to have her here to assist. So lots of people, the Arboretum has a, a whole fleet of people who help uh, <laughs> make it come to life. So we're so happy to have them here. Um, if you have questions along the way, we would love for you to put them in the chat and then we will collect them and give them to the speakers throughout the program. So if you have a question, even if it comes up while someone's talking, go ahead and put it in the chat because we will take it and give it to them throughout the program. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and now take it away, Dana. Hello everybody and thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm so excited to do this. It's, it's so wonderful of Damien and Denise to invite me to the virtual tour program. It's awesome. So I have a lot of people ask, what is an arboretum? And some people call it an arbitorium by mistake. That's completely normal actually. And an arboretum is a garden with a focus on trees. So, and I wanted to let everybody know, like she said, my camera operator today is Caitlin Murray. Caitlin, you want to say hi to everyone? <laughs> she's such a sweet girl and she's been helping me out so much through this whole process. It's been awesome. So one of my favorite trees is this gorgeous oak tree, this live oak. And the reason that I love it so much is because it branches just seem to welcome everybody into the Arboretum. The Arboretum was a strip mine back in the 1920s and that is one of the reasons for its unique terrain. It has an upper and a lower ravine that comes down. And even in the center it has a lake due to the saucer effect that the mining had on the land. It was mined for different elements, such as rutile, titanium, and even gold. The 126-acre piece of property did not make a very fruitful mine, however, and it was sold to the Jacksonville City, and it was left undeserved for, for 35 years. And to me, what it really shows is that nature, left to its own devices, can really come back beautifully. I think we saw that a lot in COVID-19, actually. A lot of great things were coming back to normal. As we enter, you'll see our first garden. This is our pollinator garden. It's really a beautiful garden that has many different plants that are good for obviously hummingbirds and the monarch butterfly. We also have um, bumblebees that visit this garden very often. I like to sit and look from the picnic tables and just watch all the activity of the birds and everything swooping into this garden constantly. And then one of the flowers that are blooming right now is this blackberry lily. It's really beautiful. It's also called the leopard lily. And what's interesting about it is it's not a lily at all. It's an iris, which I think is very interesting. So when that bloom comes off, it will actually be replaced by a little blackberry seed pod. It'll look like a blackberry and that's why it's called the blackberry lily. It's pretty interesting. So then at the end of this garden, we're going to actually be building some raised bed gardens. So this clearing right here is going to be the home of some raised beds where we're going to be able to have wheelchair access. I'm so impressed with this board because they're so thoughtful about things and they also make sure that it's very inclusive to everyone. So, you know, I'm just so proud of how thoughtful and inclusive they are. And I have more on the ADA path coming up, so more on that coming. Okay, so if you'll head this way with me. Denise, do we have any questions so far? We do. Well, I have one for you right now, <laughs> which is, um, 
what um, are some of the ways that uh, people can get involved with those uh, raised bed gardens? Oh, that's a very good question. Well, this weekend, we're actually going to start building them. And when we start to implement them, we're actually going to be inviting a few different organizations to come out and help, such as Pine Castle, because we want to make sure that we do it properly and that everything is executed well for those gardens. So we're going to incorporate some different organizations to help us make sure they're placed properly and that they're built prop to proper heights and whatnot. Yeah. But Cheyenne Katibi is our horticulturist and he'll be leading the charge. And Damien, I think Do we have other questions? Some yeah, questions. we have one more. There's a, what type of plants are you putting in those raised beds, Dana? Actually, that's going to be Cheyenne's call. And I, we've talked about it. I, it's definitely going to be something ornamental and a lot of things that that drip over but the one of the one of the things that we do at the arboretum is we have a plants and people theme so all of the plants that we have pretty much have some use or purpose even if it is just to be organically organic and beautiful so you know a lot of the plants like the pollinator garden are very useful and as we get into the palm garden i'll explain some of the uses for those plants as well so this is Boy Scout Bridge. Boy Scout Bridge is obviously built by Boy Scouts. <laughs> um, it's one of the many volunteer sectors that we have that got involved with us over the years. And we have many volunteers that assist in taking care of the Arboretum. We have um, Sierra Club that helped us carve out many of the trails. And it's such a huge operation. And with only two staff members, myself and Cheyenne, it really requires a whole volunteer community. So we do have a lot of people that are involved with us and have been from the beginning. A lot of people have never left us, which is really wonderful. But it was, you know, organizations like the Boy Scouts and Sierra Club that have made this property what it is today. And we have seven different trails on the property. So, uh, and all of them were carved out by the volunteers. So we were actually completely volunteer run up until just a couple of years ago. So if you'll head this way, this is our new ADA path. It was installed at the beginning of this year. It's about a thousand feet long and it's 10 feet wide. It encompasses our brand new shade, uh, tropical shade garden as well. So this new garden was designed by our horticulturist Cheyenne Katibi which he has done a really beautiful job. When you're walking through it, it kind of feels like you're walking through a terrarium. And it's called the Palm Garden because we have so many different types of palms. And it's a good representation of all the palms that we can actually grow in Florida. And as you go through, you'll see that a lot of the plants are labeled like this Chinese Mahonia. So that's also done by volunteers. And they're very careful about it. And they took, take a lot of pride in making sure that the names are proper to the genus and the species. And uh, we consult, actually, a lot of times, the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens for their ethnobot species. Um, if you follow us on social media, you'll see lots of pictures of owls. Um, we have a photographer, her name is Martha Mazza, and she takes pictures on this very path. We saw one yesterday, and it was um, so cute, and it was just looking down at us, and it was really loud, and so it was really exciting to see it, but it was just a little teenager, I bet, but um, it just kind of picked itself up and took off on us, but it, it looked at us for a really long time. It was really cool, and in the morning time, you can see them around the Jones Creek Trail area, as well as uh, the lower ravine. So this is our gorgeous palm garden. And I should take a moment and thank our funders who helped with the ADA path. And that would be Marcia Maderos and the Maderos family, the Dolores Bar Weaver Legacy Fund, and some of our 2018 individual donors. Dana, what are some of those some of uh, species in the palm garden? Okay, well, let's take a look. Um, we have this European fan palm. And I love that some of them have spikes and actually some of them have real leaves. 
And one of my favorites is this uh, foxtail asparagus. Anyone who's handled it can know it, it bites. <laughs> it's quite a little bitey plant. <laughs> Ouch. So, yes, yes, exactly. And then we also have some bromeliads that are within the palm garden that are really beautiful and some gingers. We have a giant walking iris over here. The thing looks like it's something out of the prehistoric days. It's just so huge and it gets gorgeous, gorgeous blooms on it. And then this is also one of my favorites, this yellow walking iris, so pretty. And they do really well in this area because the soil is pretty moist and it can just creep along and plant itself all the way throughout. So this thing is going to spread. That's and then we advice. also have, we have palms like this windmill palm. Sorry. That's good advice for uh, people who are looking for something that uh, would be a good <laughs> plant to uh, spread in their yards. Yeah, yeah. It actually walks basically is what they call it. And then um, these are uh, like windmill palms. They're really neat. And then we also have um, a palm that's on the other side that is from Madagascar. So we have palms like from all over the world in here. They're really, really unique and cool. I thought when, when they first were putting in the palm garden, I was like, palms? Don't we see enough palms? Like we live in Florida, we see palms everywhere. But now that I've seen what they've done with it, I'm like so blown away at how gorgeous it is. So, and then um, we're approaching actually an area where we are gonna be, have a really exciting opportunity. The Arboretum gets approximately 100,000 visitors per year, and we are a nonprofit. So we rely on individual donations to support our work. We, this project is one that we are currently seeking funding. It's our water garden project. This, like our other gardens, have an educational spin. It will teach folks about rain gardens and plants that grow in that type of habitat. Mostly water, but it can dry out from time to time. This garden will have multiple viewpoints. So you can see from this side, it has a pretty depression. It's going to be really beautiful. Right now it's not so pretty because all you see is this erosion fabric and it's good, that's gonna disappear because we're gonna be doing some plantings that will kind of take over in this area as a ground cover along with some boulders that will be placed in, in the palm garden and all the way down. So this is gonna have like a true botanical garden effect. It's gonna be really amazing. Which brings me to another really exciting thing that we're doing. I have been working with the board to select designers, some landscape architects and garden designers that have worked in gardens all around actually the world. They have a garden in Shanghai. Another thing that they've done is I noticed someone was from Chicago. They worked at the Morton Botanical Garden. Their names are Trey Fromey and Chris Barkley. And the board made the decision at the last board meeting that we are actually going to hire these amazing designers. So I just can't wait to see what this is going to turn into. Trey was at the meeting the other night. We had a meeting of the minds about what we were going to do with the ponds. Because what happened was we decided to go ahead and dig these ponds while we were doing the ADA path because it just makes sense while we had big equipment out here. So that's why we have the palms. So now we're in the design phase of what plantings are we going to put on this beautiful pond and how is it all going to work? And in the meeting, it was just really exciting to hear Trey talking about all the different design elements that he's going to put into this. So I'm really excited about that. I grew up in Jacksonville, so I can't wait to see, you know, a botanical garden, a true botanical garden that will rival other botanical gardens in other cities like Atlanta and Miami, the Miami Fling Flamingo Botanical Gardens. I mean, there's there's beautiful gardens in different cities. I don't know why Jacksonville doesn't have one yet, and I'm just really excited. I do think that the Zoo and Gardens has a really beautiful garden, but this is just the set for the perfect landscape of doing something amazing to put in a botanical garden here. I'd like to know how many people are in favor of that and what they think of that. Um, we're also going to be keeping uh, the seven natural trails that are also involved here at the Arboretum. So that will all stay natural, but we are going to do some more ornamentals and things in the center around the lake loop.
Right. So I think we have is there any other questions? Yeah, we do have some questions for you. Damien? Yeah, um, there was one question from Debbie that she's asking if you need any sponsors for your garden. We do need sponsors for our garden. Absolutely. You do? Okay, awesome. We'll be putting a link later on to the Arboretum's website where you can reach out to them. And also, Dana, are there any plans for the hands-on children garden, children's garden like the one in San Diego? There are. Actually, Trey Fromey uh, was talking about a children's garden just the other day. And um, if you take a look at Cheekwood, they did, no, I'm sorry. He, he is just finishing up a garden in Tulsa Oklahoma and he did a children's garden there and if you go to the Tulsa Botanical Gardens website you will see the children's garden that he designed and it is incredible so I just can't wait for him to get involved with us because I know that it's going to involve some some different structures and things for children to have interactive with and it's going to be a lot of interpretive educational opportunities too so it's going to be a lot of fun to work with them I'm, I'm thrilled about it do we have any other questions? That's it for now. Thank you so much. Okay, great. I think we can turn it over to Catherine so she can tell everyone about the pitcher plant project. Awesome. All right, Catherine. All right. So, Hello, everybody. My name's Catherine. Um, Y'all can hear me okay, right? Yes. Okay. Just because there was some little errors before. Um, so currently I'm at about the midpoint of the lower ravine trail. So the trail is just kind of like a, a very long horseshoe and I'm just like at the very end of it. So if you uh, jot that down, you can try and find these uh, little guys yourself. But um, I'm gonna be talking about the pitcher plants. Um, I'm currently in a replica uh, that was funded by um, the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens. Um, I'm in a, sorry, a replica of a bog because um, we found it necessary that our pitcher plants in Florida um, aren't being, they're just not as prevalent as they used to be. Um, so this project was started to try and create the correct habitat and ecosystem for them in order for them to have like a thriving community. So. I'm in a bog. You may be wondering, well, what is a bog? So a bog is a type of um, wetland that is characterized by having this plant called sphagnum moss. So sphagnum moss has two parts. It basically has the spongy green top part, and then it also has the like the peat soil on the bottom, which is pretty much just organic matter. And the nature of sphagnum moss is when it's in water, it tends to make all of the water super acidic or more acidic than any other waterway. So because it's so acidic, it's kind of low in nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. So whereas in a creek where, um, sorry, I keep, getting, I keep reading the chat, getting like a little distracted. I have to just look somewhere else. But um, in a creek where a plant might be able to get all these essential nutrients, since the bog is so acidic, um, some carnivorous plants have started to grow as a way to kind of work around that lack of nitrogen. So carnivorous plants generally need uh, nitrogen and phosphorus just like any other plant, but since they can't get it, they decided bugs have a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. Why don't we get it from them? So I'm sure you've all heard of the Venus flytrap, the one that kind of does this over the bugs. It, this one acts very similar in the sense that it has this gooey, juicy sap to it that the bugs love um, and lots of hairs that get it stuck. So now I will be turning my camera so I can show these little pitcher plants. Oh, let me do a, a wide shot first. So here is the replica bog and a bunch of these little bunches are the um, pitcher plants. So I'm just gonna be looking at this little guy. He happens to be the one most in the shade. Um, the pitcher plant probably isn't too happy with me right now. I'm wearing some bug spray, so I might be warding off some of the critters he wants. Um, so if we look at the pitcher plant, uh, it is called a pitcher plant for obvious reasons. It 
it kind of looks like a pitcher. Um, also, these tend to fill up with water. And if you were to pick it, which of course I won't, but if you were to pick it, it would pour out of water. So the pitcher plant has a ton of these downward facing hairs inside of them. Let me see if I can just get like a little bit of a better, I hope it's not too blurry for y'all, a little bit of a better look. That looks beautiful. Um, so the pitcher plant utilizes these little teeny tiny hairs um, and has all this nectar. So basically like there's an ant scurrying on it right now, but let's say the ant goes in and is like, oh, that smells good. So basically the ant goes in, all of a sudden he's like, oh no, I'm trapped in all these hairs. The hairs kind of push him down. Um, and then he ends up in this bottom portion of the pitcher plant. And like I said, they fill up with water. So the first step is usually they drown the insect in one way or another. And then once they um, drown the insect, then the digestion starts to happen. And they just have lots of digestive um, fluids, just like a person would. Um, cool thing about pitcher plants is they can get super big and there's lots of different types. So there's different types that kind of will have like an open top. Um, so large things like mice have actually been known to sneak in there, um, which is very crazy. Um, I think that is about it for pitcher plants. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, we have a couple. Um, are those pitcher plants recently planted, Catherine? Yes, they are. I believe within the last year. Okay, so they're new. And do you know they're where we can new. find them in Jacksonville? If someone yes, to actually. Them. So if you, there is, I think it's on Jack's hikes, exclamation point, dot com or dot org, something like that. They actually list all of the trails that you can find them at. But like I was saying before, they're not really in a high population in Florida anymore. So that's kind of, whether it be from habitat destruction or anything like that, wetlands are typically the ones that um, become the most endangered. Um, so that's why this project was so important because it's so hard to find them. Um, but I heard west of Tallahassee has them, but I don't know, I guess you have to go, go searching. Not that far. <laughs> looking for a place where they can um, purchase these to plant in their own yards and we can do some research to see what, what we can find out about that. Yeah. Oh, There's one, one, more, one more really crazy question. This, this is, uh, Glenda says it's a crazy question, but she's asking if you can drink the water from one of those if needed. <laughs> you know? Oh, oh, I have a fun fact for you. Oh, awesome. So not the pitcher plant, but like I was saying before, the sphagnum moss, it's super spongy. And actually, I believe it was Native Americans used to use them as lining in a diaper because they're so absorbent. Um, and also, they kind of have this incredible filtration system. So if you pick up a chunk, they're usually soaked with water and you just squeeze it supposedly i mean i wouldn't do it but supposedly it's supposed to be safe to drink safer survival survival you know yeah survival. exactly <laughs> you do what you gotta do <laughs> in a pinch <laughs> <laughs> all right okay anybody else have any more questions for catherine oh that's it all thank right. you so much catherine all right, and off to Doug, who um, is in a trail very nearby. He's going to show you around the forest a little bit. All right, let's see if we can get Doug on the line there. There he is. Hi, Doug. Yes, hello, hello. <laughs> My name is Doug Gagno, as I was introduced. I'm a master naturalist with the state of Florida, and I'm a volunteer for about 10 years here. But uh, I volunteer as a nature tour guide. The bridge that uh, Caitlin is standing on to take a picture of me has been built by volunteers and funded by REI. So volunteers and contributions that make up the, the very heart of the Arboretum and Gardens. Now, a beautiful garden plant right here is flowering right now and it's going to produce a gorgeous purple berry. This is called Colicarpa Americana, the American beauty berry. And we'd be remiss if we did not introduce the state tree, 
this is it. The palm tree, the sable palmetto. And uh, the sable palmetto can be identified by this sword-like spear that enters into the frond, that spear-like, that makes it different from uh, the uh, saw palmetto. And by the way, it's called the cabbage palmetto because this center live part of the growing part of the plant can be taken and made into a, a soup, a cabbage type soup. However, I must admit, I must tell you that if you do that, the sable palmetto will die. Now, another plant that has been used not only by the Native Americans, but by the early settlers is the bayberry or the wax palmetto. This wax palmetto gets dark like berries on it, very hard, dark, almost black berries that can be used to boil in a uh, potion and bring the wax to the top. And it was actually used by the Native Americans and the early settlers uh, as a substitute for wax. Now, we are in a lowland here. Compared to the Lake Loop Trail above us, we are now about 25, 30 feet below that. So this is a moist, cool, naturally air-conditioned part of the Arboretum and Gardens. So as a lowland, this particular spot here, which is not too far from where where uh, Catherine was talking about the picture plants is the uh, lower ravine trail. So off of the Jones Creek Trail, we have the lower ravine and the upper ravine trail. And we're in kind of a seepage zone here where streams and uh, springs bring the water to the surface. And the Jones Creek then drains all of this area the plants that are here, these for things like titanium. So uh, literally in the 60s, these trees were planted, and now as you all the loblolly all good size, they're all about the same age. Another iconic it's so grand, you can't imagine it's like over six inches wide. So the Magnolia grandifolia the very shiny, long leaves. So as we walk down the trail now, we're in a, we're in a bay gall area where a lot of species of bay plant, bay trees can be found. This one right here, going a little bit off of the trail, this is the Loblolly Bay. And in another spot in the uh, Arboretum, we have the national champion, Loblolly Bay. So back up on the trail again, Bean takes off to where Catherine was speaking about the pitcher plants. And now we're walking along the boardwalk, looking at the forest and noticing all the plants, a lot of the bay plants, Loblolly Bay, Loblolly pine. And as you, if Caitlin turns around and looks to the forest, you'll see that this was planted uh, with hundreds of uh, Loblolly Bay pine. So going further down the trail, we encounter other, other plants. Again, all of these bridges, like we're seeing right here, are built by volunteers. 
Every second Saturday, volunteers gather and do their work on the trails. Now, here's a uh, plant that uh, has, well, I should point this out, leaves of three, let it be. Well, there's poison ivy, if you want to look at that poison ivy right there on the uh, swamp tupelo, swamp tupelo, another plant that likes to get its feet wet in the lowlands. So again, this ecosystem is a bayhead or a bagel. So as we go further into the forested region, we pass by the trail to the upper ravine, which overlooks the bog-like area that uh, Catherine was into, the lower ravine, and different species, of course, inhabit that area. Walking down, we see the twisted trunk of the tulip tree. It's called a tulip tree. If I can get you to take a look at this, the, the leaf kind of looks like a tulip and the flowers are orange and yellow and cream colored. Just a gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous blossom. But this is a strangely twisted uh, tree here but it is the tulip tree still, and it rises to about 90 feet above. Doug, I'd like to, while you're walking to your next de destination, we have a couple questions that are coming in that are relevant to that portion of the trail you're on. Yes. What is the white powder that's on the trail? The uh, light powder on the trail? Mm-hmm. Well, that's literally from uh, the uh, silt that uh, ends up on all of this part of the trail. All of this bottom land has silt on it because it often gets flooded. This area, not quite as much as the area that we're going to see in a bit, but that is uh, a silt and it almost looks like salt, but it is silt from, from flooding. Nice. Can you also talk about the ecosystem? Because it seems that the Arboretum is, uh, it, it's, it's, I mean, it, the ecosystem is pretty balanced. There's a, a wide variety of different types of plant species. Um, yeah. Talk, yeah. Talk about the ecosystems as you go from place to place. Well, this next ecosystem, we just left the Bayhead, Bagal, and now we're entering the bottomland hardwood forest ecosystem. And this uh, bridge here, of course, is built over the Jones Creek. And we're passing right by some of the trees right here. This is a red maple right off to the side here with lichens on it. That's one of the species that likes to get its feet wet right along the Jones Creek. And uh, this tree right here with a vine growing up on it is the... Uh, uh, the uh, li liquid amber striris siflua. It's not the black, uh, but it's the sweet gum tree. And if we look at the, uh, the Jones Creek now, we notice that it is copper colored. Now it's not dirty water. It's got the copper color from the tannins that leach out of the bark and the, the uh, plant species that are here. So all along this creek, it has that copper look to it. So again, this is the ecosystem called the bottomland hardwood ecosystem or plant community. Now, when, if you could hey, Doug, look here. Doug, one question. Where is that water coming from that's in Jones Creek? What is, it Pardon me? what is Jones Creek connected to? Well, Jones Creek is a watershed in the Arlington area of Jacksonville. It comes out of the east and twists and turns its way through here and flows from east to the west, draining this, this part of the land, the lowland area. And then it takes a turn and goes north. Uh, Right alongside the north flowing Jones Creek is the Holly Oaks residence area. 
So this area was actually purchased as a buffer zone between the uh, water treatment plant that was being built by the city and the residents. So this 120 acres was once used as a dump, now has been reclaimed by the, the, the plant species themselves. Now, if I could get you, Caitlin, to take a look here. This is silt from the river, the Jones Creek, coming up here several feet and depositing silt or very light, light, light sand. And at the same time, if you turn around and take a look, this is one of the non-native species. It's an invasive species called air potato. And we are trying to eradicate the air potato, but it is a formidable foe. We have introduced some biological control in the, the namesake of a red and black beetle, but that has only been to slightly control it. It, it has not been able to get rid of the air potato. Any more questions at this point as we walk along this bottom land? Sure, you, the air potato, I have that in my backyard, Doug, and I, it's growing along a fence. And is there a, a natural pest deterrent that could be used to eradicate that? Uh, the air potato? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, that there's a red and black beetle, a very small beetle, about only uh, a quarter of an inch long, that we have been able to use to try to control the air potato. But it hasn't been entirely successful. Now, one plant that is a, a curiosity here is the gold club. In the spring, it has a club-like uh, stalk on it that has the flowering piece. But if I take water, or if I even spit on that, that leaf there, that broad leaf, it is waterproof. <laughs> And so it's called the never wet. Uh, any water, any moisture just beads up on it and runs right off. So it's called the never wet. Somebody was very creative, don't you think? So again, we're walking along this area that does get plenty of uh, moisture. The uh, water here gets uh, probably as high as, there's the creek, and I would say the water gets as high as probably right here. Now this, by the way, is a different tree uh, vine. It's the creeping jenny. It is not necessarily uh, an active uh, irritant like poison ivy, but some people do react to it. Uh, I react to poison ivy, but I don't react at all to the creeping jenny, there you see. And many beautiful ferns are in this area, like the royal fern here, the royal fern. There's the netted chain fern. This one. And uh, there's some cinnamon fern in here as well. Now, another invasive, by invasive we mean plants that are not native to the area, but tend to take over and outcompete the native plants. This is wild taro, wild taro. I'm told that the Native Americans would use the tuber at the root of the wild taro and make a, a sort of a bread out of it. Uh, they also did that with the kunti palm. Oh. Here's another tree that likes to get its feet wet. It has a star-shaped leaf and it is the uh, sweet gum. And it has the creeping jenny on its bark. So again, we're, we're coming up to another beautiful bridge that volunteers have built here. We oh, have we... signs here I'm that sorry, say, go... stay, stay out of the water. Oh. Going back There's to that bacteria that, level. There is an area you mentioned, uh, Doug, in reference to the cinnamon fern. Why is it called the cinnamon fern? Do you have any reference about that? Yeah, the stalk of the cinnamon fern rises up right out of the leaves, and it looks uh, looks like cinnamon. It's a uh, orangish, reddish, burnt, burnt orange kind of color, and that's why they call it the cinnamon fern. It has 
large, large leaves. We have a couple of spots here where things are identified as cinnamon fern. Uh, there's another example of how ubiquitous the air potato is. We just are having a dickens of a time trying to get rid of it. So now we're leaving the bottom land hey, Doug. and going up is to the upland mixed forest, another ecosystem called the upland mixed forest. Now, if you take a look at that tree that's bending over the trail, that's a water oak. So that's perfect for this bottom land. But as we go up, we don't find many water oak. And find, in fact, we find uh, uh, trees like uh, the cherry trees and uh, the elderberry tree, which has fruit at the very top in clusters. There's a cluster right there. And it is used to make a very delicious, sweet wine. That's the elderberry tree. I've heard elderberries are also very, very medicinal. They're really good for uh, phlegm and coughing. Uh, a lot of people use elder elderberry supplements as well. Is that true? Uh, that is true. The even more uh, notorious one that's in popular lore as well as a good effect for uh, dealing with a lung problem or uh, suppressing a cough, that comes from the wild cherry. And there's a lot of wild cherry up on this uh, upland mixed forest area. Again, this is the ecosystem called upland mixed forest. Uh, when we talk about ecosystem, we're really talking about a plant community, a plant community. Now, here again, let's notice the state tree, the sable palmetto, and we can see easily that spear-like projection into the frond. I want to show it different from the saw palmetto because we've got saw palmetto right up next to us here. So right here, you notice the stem stops and does not go into the frond. That's a saw palmetto, and it's called saw because it has a serrated edge on the stem, the saw palmetto. So that's the difference between the saw palmetto and the sable palmetto. Here again, you can see the stem stopping all along in these saw palmetto. Now, in this upland mixed forest area, we have a lot of oaks, a lot of hickory, pig nut hickory. And I can show you here, Caitlin, if you will take a look. These are nuts from the pig nut hickory tree. And I understand that the wild pigs especially like those nuts and maybe some of the uh, cultivated pigs as well. This is a hickory leaf. And this is a hickory tree with a vine on it. And if you go into this area, you can, in the fall especially, pick up a lot of hickory nuts. They're all over along in here, just like I'm picking up what right here. There, I just picked it up off the forest floor. This is pig nut hickory. There's another hickory here that grows here called the mocker nut. This one looks sort of pear shaped. The mocker nut is more circular if you were to find a mocker nut uh, in this area. Now, the magnolia grows up in this area very, very well. It's typically called the southern magnolia, magnolia grandifolia, grandifloria. And notice the bright, shiny leaf dull on the bottom, and the bark is fairly smooth. Doug, right, you, going you right along. That, you've, you've been on that trail for a, quite a bit. How long is that trail? Uh, about a half a mile. Wow. This is uh, the Bluff Loop. Uh, this was created after uh, Hurricane Matthew and some other hurricanes took down some large hickory and uh, 
made it impossible for us to keep the trail right on the bluff overlooking the Jones Creek. But one time I was down here at the creek and overlooked when we did have the bluff, uh, did not have the bluff loop, but the trail went right to the edge of the bluff. And I noticed a couple river otters playing. So there's a lot of different wildlife in this area. So as we continue to walk along, we're walking past hickory and magnolia and oaks. And over here, we've got the hornbeam. This is the eastern hornbeam. It's one of the species of iron trees. And in a moment, we're going to show you uh, one that is the American hornbeam that is called the muscle tree. I will introduce that in just a moment. Now, as I said, the uh, wild cherry is used as a cough suppressant and a treatment for lung diseases. And we've got a fine example of wild cherry all along in here. These are, these are young wild cherry right here. Doug, how well does uh, wild cherry grow, um, perhaps if somebody wanted to grow it in their yards? Uh, I'll tell you, I've tried to grow it in my own yard, and it will get uh, totally out of control. It, it is very easily uh, distributed naturally. Now, however, the wild cherry uh, can be eaten, as we've said. It, uh, the Luden's cough uh, medicine company produces wild cherry lozenges that have been used for many, many years to treat uh, mostly suppression of a cough. This uh, hickory tree is very interesting. The yellow-bellied sapsucker has made horizontal intrusions into this tree all the way up, but it's still alive even as the yellow-bellied sapsucker has cleaned it of insects many, many times. And that's a type of uh, woodpecker, correct? Yes, a type of woodpecker. Thank you for adding that. <laughs> I, uh, I shouldn't assume that everybody knows the birds. Well, we also have a question too on the trail in reference to uh, the trail. Like, is there any concern with snakes? Uh, we do have snakes here. I've, I've never really run into them. Several people have mentioned that in the uh, scrub area, uh, like uh, the Live Oak Trail and uh, the upper trail there, like the Rosemary area, that there are rattlesnakes. I have not seen them. Uh, some people have even seen the uh, endangered indigo snake, but I have not seen them. So Doug, we have time for sh to show us one more tree. I think you wanted to show us the, uh, is it the muscle tree? I'm sorry, again? <laughs> you wanted to show us one more tree. I think it was the muscle tree, is that correct? Yeah, we're going down to the muscle tree now, and that'll be uh, pretty much the conclusion of our Jones Creek Trail. Okay. We're, we're going down to see the muscle tree Here's an example of a mocker nut as opposed to the, here I'll show you the two difference. Mocker nut versus the pig nut hickory. What's a mocker nut? Well, it's a hickory nut, but it uh, isn't any more edible, I don't think, than, uh, than the uh, pig nut hickory. We humans don't... Uh, have a, a good taste for mocker nut or pig nut. I want to get a, an example of, uh, show an example of the uh, wild cherry tree right here. This tree right here is wild cherry with the, the blanket red lichen and white gray lichen on it. That's the wild cherry. That's the one that is used, the bark 
is processed and they make a, a cough suppressant out of it. And uh, it's only the fleshy part of the cherry that's edible. The seed, if you were to eat the seed, is toxic. So you don't want to do that. Right uh, behind Caitlin, as we come up to a tree that's over the trail, that's a different cherry. That's the Carolina laurel cherry. And it has a different uh, uh, fruit entirely. Its fruit is, is pear-like, very small, but pear-like, whereas the wild cherry is entirely round. So here we're walking down from the uh, upland forest, and we're entering the Jones Creek area again. And uh, I want to introduce the, uh, the, the mussel tree. We all have ligaments and muscles in our body. This tree is called the mussel tree because it looks like it has ligaments and muscles on it. It's the American hornbeam, the American hornbeam. That's great, Doug. Thank you so much. I think um, at this point, we need to uh, take a few questions and then uh, send it back to Dana to wrap up. Well, let's take one more look, okay? Okay. We want to introduce the, the uh, huge cypress, the bald cypress, and then note the knees to the bald cypress that supposedly provide oxygen and air when the area is entirely flooded. And this, of course, is the Jones Creek again. So we've completed our tour of the Jones Creek. It was very interesting. We're getting tons of great feedback about how great the session is and the view. Thank you so much for a really informative tour. Um, one question, yeah. that, that yes. th this area is so vast and it's it, it, it seems like you've named at least I would say at least 20 to 35 different types of plant species. Were some of them planted by the volunteers or staff of the Arboretum or did they just grow, grow naturally? Yeah, the Arboretum has planted some of the species and especially the areas when the storms have knocked out a hickory or a big oak, that area is left to uh, bring up what it will. But at the same time, there are plants and that's why the, uh, the, the JAG is the whole name of the garden, Arboretum and Gardens. So there are some non-native species, but we will not, we will not plant invasive species. We, we will plant uh, non-natives like in the camellia garden or the tea garden or the, the butterfly garden. A lot of those would be non-native, but they're not the type that would be invasive and take over the area. Well, earlier you mentioned the Loblolly Bay, and there was also another one, but the Loblolly Bay is the actual flower for the garden club. So I'm sure either Denise or I will be reaching out to you to find out how we can get more planted at the garden club. <laughs> yeah. That planted. I'm holding on to a Loblolly Bay right here. Awesome. <laughs> All right, Doug. Well, thank you. Let's send it back to Dana if we can find her somewhere out in the Arboretum. All right. Take care. Thank you, Doug. Okay, I'm on Catherine's screen now. Can you see me on Catherine's screen? We yeah. have to do a switcheroo. That's cool. Okay, so you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So we want everyone to go to Jack's Best on WJXT and vote for the winner again this year. We won last year for Best Trails. And so we want to win again this year and you can vote once a day. So vote every day <laughs> so that we can win this award again. Because it's so amazing to be able to tout that we have the best trails in Jacksonville, which is true. Um, and also I wanted to point out over here in the mornings is where you'll be able to see the owls. Um, 
Pamela Tellis, who is also on um, our call with us, she was out with me one morning. We were able to hook up with Martha, and Martha pointed them out to us. Martha is that board member who has incredible photography skills. So I know we're moving kind of quickly, and I'm sorry about that, but I definitely want to get a lake view for you so you can see our lake that is in the center of our property, which will be developing our botanical gardens as the center. So we definitely want to showcase this really beautiful lake. Okay, Catherine, if you want to put me in that way. Now in this lake, there are lots of fish, turtles, there's also alligators. So we want to make sure that um, no one feeds anything in this lake. If you feed anything in this lake, it will get un, it will not be scared of humans anymore. And we want the animals to be scared of humans to keep everyone safe. So please, if you're out here, please don't feed anything in the lake. And this is our beautiful pavilion. How much time do we have, Denise? Are we doing okay? Yeah, I'd say give it another five minutes. Okay, great. This is our pavilion where recently, because of COVID-19, there were a lot of brides and grooms that their venues had to close and the Arboretum was open. So we did some pop-up weddings and we allowed the brides and grooms to come here and get married. It was when the restrictions were 10 people or less, so it wasn't a big impact on the property and we were able to allow families to get together and, and celebrate the union. So it was really a nice thing, but we are in the process of building our wedding packages now. And so we will be doing weddings here at the Arboretum soon. And that brings me to our events as well. We have some incredible events that, are, that take place every year. We have a plein air event where we have the plein air paint society come out and they do um, paintings all around the location of the Arboretum. They select a spot and they start painting from there. And then at the end of the event, they sell some of the art pieces. It's a really great event. It's a two day event. Um, it obviously got punted to fall this year because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we will have to reschedule that this year. Um, and then in the fall, we typically have an event also called Spirits Under the Sun, which is just a really great party. And it has, uh, all kinds of different restaurants that participate with us and it's called spirits under the sun for a really good reason too <laughs> we have some pretty good spirits so and then i also just as we're wrapping up um we're going to be doing an event soon with the zoo the jacksonville zoo and gardens is a great partner of ours so we're going to be doing an event uh, about bats and I'm so excited about it. We're gonna put out a bat poll out here that's gonna identify the different types of species of bats that live on the property. And so we're so excited to be able to learn what different types of bat, maybe in the past few years, if we've, because we did this experiment a few years ago, we had like eight different species of bats. And I didn't even know that that many lived in this area. So that's really exciting. So, and then, um, We'll do that virtually, that event, in July. And then we hope to be able to follow it up as a family in-person event where we will chalk outlines for people to be able to sit and be comfortable in social distancing. And we'll have widescreen TVs. It'll be at night. So we can do maybe a bat walk around the property and you can hopefully catch um, a view or a sighting of some of the bats that are within the Arboretum. So it's a really cool event and we're really excited about it. And then um, we, we are gonna have lots more of really cool events that are coming up in the following year. Hopefully COVID-19 won't get in our way and we'll be able to gather again soon because um, it's put such a damper on some of the ways that we can get together. But, you know, Denise, this has been such a great experience for all of us and we're so glad that you invited us to this virtual experience today. What do you guys think? Dana, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, sure. Dana, do we have any questions um, that have come through in the last uh, few minutes for? No, no questions, but just everyone's saying thank you so much for the this this uh, the views and so much information. Where where you have a bunch of fans out there. Yay! Uh, yeah, lots of fans. <laughs> and a lot of people are interested in going back to the arboretum after having been gone for a while. So. Yeah, we definitely have some new installations for gardens and, you know, so many new things that are going to be coming up along the way. And, uh, you know, it's just a beautiful place. And 
when we did have to close, the outcry was tremendous because this for a lot of people relates to mental health as well. So it's really important for people to be able to get out in the sunshine, enjoy our trails. And so we're so happy to be able to be open. We prefer for people to wear masks if you, we encourage it. But if you don't want to, it is a big wide open space. Hey, no. Chances are you're safe. You yes. see right now, cause uh, I think somebody's hand is over the camera. Oh, you're. Your hand is over the camera. <laughs> we saw red. <laughs> we can see the blood in her hand. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> well, if you guys want to come over, we'll all say goodbye. Um, my husband is here, Matt Duty. And Matt, will you come take the camera from Catherine? And we'll all do a quick wrap up and say goodbye. We'll we'll socially distance as much as we can and still get in the shot. <laughs> While we're doing that, Thank there was Denise. one question you, for, Damien. you're welcome. There was one question for Catherine and I was waiting for we, us to come to the very end. When she was talking about the, the bogs, there, was, there were blueberries. Um, are there planting, or are you guys have more plants of planting more blueberries in the bog? Doug, do we plant blueberries? A lot of these questions, are, and the reason why I brought Doug along is because he really is the brain to this operation. <laughs> do we do we typically plant any blueberries? the sand hill ranch as well. But the only plantings that I'm aware of right now, we're we're actually taking out invasives right now and planting the pitcher plant. But I don't think we have in the past, have we? He doesn't think so. Okay. So. All right. Well, I'm gonna give you all a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> um, I'm now gonna share my screen again and uh, close out with a couple of points of uh, interest that I want everybody to know about. Um, first of all, yeah, thank you to Dana, to Doug, to Catherine, to Kayla, Caitlin. Um, we're so grateful to have you all. Um, you did a great job, and um, we're very, very happy to have such a great resource of the Jacksonville Arboretum and Gardens in Jacksonville. And if you haven't been, you need to go. All right. So in the meantime, hold on. I need to figure out how to share my screen again. All right, um, I want to tell you about a couple of uh, programs that are coming up at the Garden Club. Um, we have uh, Grow Your Groceries, The Lazy Way, and uh, that is with the man in overalls. Many of you have heard of the man in overalls. He's uh, based in Springfield. He has a backyard farm uh, that uh, is growing lots of great vegetables, and he is going to show you how you can do it in your own yard and maybe be a little lazy about it. Um, that's 6 p.m. June 23rd, and I believe Damien is putting the link into the chat now, so you can click on it from there. We also have a different kind of landscaping featuring the Six Foot Away Gallery. This is going to be a fantastic program with Shawana Brooks and Roosevelt Watson III. Roosevelt is a fabulous visual artist and Shawana is a curator and they have put together a really cool um, outdoor yard exhibit um, and using their landscape in a totally different way. So that's 6 p.m. June 30th. So please join us for that. And Damien will put the link for that into the chat. We also wanted to let you know about this gardening for pollinators program that the UF IFAS Extension Office is doing. It's only $15 and you can um, enroll through August 15th. It's a several hour self-guided program and uh, includes uh, one of the instructors is Clay County Horticultural Extension Agent, Wayne Hobbs, who many of you might know. And there's a link for that that Damien is also going to add to the chat. And while we have you all here, we can't help but uh, tell you that if you become a member of the Garden Club, you can support programs just like this and uh, the Garden Club's mission, and we really need you to help us grow, and uh, we would love to have you as members. So please join the, the club if you haven't already. If you are a member, we thank you dearly, and, uh, and we love having you. 
Uh, and there's a link that uh, Damien is going to add to the chat for that. We do surveys after each one of our virtual programs because we really want to know how what you thought. Uh, so we have a uh, survey that uh, Damien's going to add uh, the link for that into the chat and uh, tell us what you thought of the program and um, tell us what kind of programs you want to see in the future. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, places for you to put your uh, two cents in there and tell us what you want to see. I'd like to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund once again for making programs like this one possible. We are so grateful for their support. And I want to thank my co-host, Damien. Thanks, Damien. Thank you. thank you. So welcome. I had a great time. This was super, super informative. Yeah. Number three. This was number three. So. Number three. And I want to thank all of you out there for attending this. Um, we can't do programs like this without you, because otherwise we'd just be talking to ourselves, which is fun, but not as fun without you. All right, everybody, thank you. Have a lovely evening and uh, stay cool out there, because it's, uh, it's a lovely evening and it's a good time to go out and take a walk. Goodbye. Bye.